Hello, my friends. Thank you for joining me at Evolutionary Energy Arts once again. So we have cold and snow canceling 17 major league baseball games. You know, you know, in the past, yeah, it's happened here or there. 17 different games. <laughs> wow. You know, you know things are out of the norm when you have that happening. And, you know, this is just getting rolled up. We're just getting started, my friends. So these are some photos that show the Saudi region is getting covered in snow again. And this really isn't normal. The region experienced rain and snow for six hours. And uh, they've had several snows and the snow is everywhere. There's a lot of snow going on right now over in France, as well as much of Europe. So the snow keeps falling and we are in April. So what are they going to say if they get snow in May? <laughs> hey, that rhymed. Sorry about that. French snow reports and conditions. Well, you know, if, if you're a skier, hey, this is great. If you love winter sports, then you are in for a beautiful time because this is going to be with us for most of our lifetimes, if not all of our lifetimes, because we really don't know exactly where this is going to go unseasonable rains are causing widespread crop loss and as time goes on this is going to be the biggest thing it's really going to be food production and then shelter in in areas where people are living in very cold areas they're going to get even colder so we need to prepare we really do we need to prepare as as a, a global unit you know we have to Oh, we need to put people in office that are going to actually watch what's happening around them and not just simply care about their own ego, their own, you know, needs, wants, and desires, and really care for people and be aware of these things. So, tremendous crop loss going on right now, and this is this is over in, in India. And, you know, there's crop losses going on everywhere. And when the unseasonable snow keeps going and plantings are going to be delayed in both North America and in Europe, you know, you're going to you're going to see the cost of food is going to be skyrocketing. So more than ever, it's a great time to take care of yourself in your own and basically start your own gardening. Do what you can get into the. Uh, the habit now. This is very interesting. Um, expression patterns of cryptochrome genes in avian retina suggest involvement of CRY4 in light dependent magnetoreception. So basically, it's saying that birds can actually see differences in the geomagnetic field. Pretty cool when you think about it we know that you know dogs and cats see differently than we do they have a, a wider spectrum of vision than we do it turns out that birds are able to actually see uh, the geomagnetic field itself so maybe besides sensing something happening and say like we're talking about the area in Oregon and Washington um, where in like southern Oregon so many of the birds have left Maybe they're seeing visually the changes in the geomagnetic field themselves and are saying, uh-oh, better to go to a different area right now because something is going to happen. Or in, actually, when they're seeing it, they're probably thinking something is happening and it's best to vacate the area. So very, very interesting study. You know, we as humans, we've kind of had the thought that if we can't see something, it doesn't exist for so many of us. Well, not the case. There's an awful lot that exists that we can't see. And so do you remember we were talking about the plasma core theory of the Earth, which, again, it just seems to make more and more sense uh, when we think about everything that's going on right now. Well, astronomers capture visual evidence of giant plasma structures above Earth. And 
one of you uh, out there as subscribers sent me an interesting video which I haven't gotten permission to use so I, I didn't pull it up um, but if you wanted to go on YouTube and Google uh, plasma structure you might find uh, the video that shows something just like this and so if there are plasma structures above the earth they're, they're reflective of what's going on inside the earth with the plasma structure in there and that just shows us how everything is so tied together and what we have going on with the magnetosphere is creating changes that we really can't even we can't even really begin to guess you know how intense they're going to be it's really amazing you know what's coming so for the first time astronomers have captured visual evidence of existence of tubular plasma structures living in the inner layers of the magnetosphere that surrounds the earth for over 60 years scientists believe these structures existed but by imaging them for the first time we've provided visual evidence that they really are there the discovery of the structures is important because they cause unwanted signal distortions that could, for example, affect our civilian and military satellite-based navigation systems. So we need to understand them. The plasma and the magnetosphere, which is the region of space around the Earth occupied by the magnetic field, is created by the atmosphere being ionized by sunlight. The ionosphere is the innermost layer of the magnetosphere, and higher up is the plasmosphere. These are implanted with mainly odd, oddly shaped plasma structures, including the tubes. We measure their position to be about 600 kilometers above the ground in the upper ionosphere and that they appear to be continuing upwards into the plasmosphere. This is around where the, the neutral atmosphere ends and we are transitioning to the plasma of outer space. So very, very cool stuff as we learn more and more about the world that we are a part of. So. You know, global warming, um, do we have to worry about the North Pole melting? Well, with these temperatures running between 17 below and 24 below, not anytime soon, really. Um, it's pretty cold up there. Solar activity over nine millennia, a consistent multi-proxy reconstruction. And basically, yeah, again, we are seeing that, as we had said before about a month ago in one of the videos, with a different study that was out. The so solar activity we have going on now is going to be record-breaking. And in fact, if, if we are just thinking in terms of a mini ice age like we've had in the past, every few hundred years, we are totally underestimating what we are in. I mean, completely underestimating what we are in because the sun hasn't been like this for over 9,000 years. So you have to start thinking in bigger terms than a mini ice age. It's gonna be much more than a mini ice age. And as we have said before, there's more than one thing going on. So when we think about, you know, what should we do? You know, what, what, what's, how do we plan for a worst case scenario? Well, let's look at North America during the Ice Age, the actual Ice Age, and where the sheets of ice were. And you could see that they extended pretty far down. If you are in Ohio, three quarters of the state of Ohio was covered in ice. All of New York State covered, all of Connecticut, Rhode Island, all of New England completely covered in ice. Long Island covered in ice. Indiana almost entirely and covered in ice. Same thing with Illinois, almost entirely Wisconsin. Um, you know, you, these, these states just almost completely covered in ice. The northern part of Washington state, yes. Also the same. And then in the peaks of the, the Colorado Rockies, they were all covered as well. And then never covered by ice, the southern states, which um, thankfully over the years, so many people have been moving to. So, you know, if that was the only thing we had to worry about, everybody come join me in Florida because things are great here. You know, I mean, the weather's a little cooler than normal, but still, I mean, it's beautiful. It's 80 degrees. You know, it's going to be another gorgeous sunny day. We're going to be going into the 60s overnight. I mean, it doesn't get much more pleasant than that. Well, unfortunately, that's not the only thing going on. 
we also have a definite magnetic pole shift or excursion going on. Now, we could call it an excursion at the moment because, you know, many times in the past, a pole shift has started and it doesn't take fully. And that's the last time it tried to do that. That's exactly what happened. The poles reverted. They may revert again. They may. We don't know. Um, we really don't know. I don't think there's anybody that does know. Um, however, you know, we are definitely in a period where a pole shift, a magnetic pole shift has started. And as we have said, we are anywhere between 15 and 20 percent um, we've lost that much of the magnetosphere. 15 to 20 percent of the magnetosphere is already declined and is gone. And you know, some people basically say that we get down to a certain point, it'll almost be that it's uninhabitable on the surface of the Earth. And there will be pockets, like if you, if you watch um, Suspicious Observers, great channel, uh, Ben has shown that there'll be pockets on the planet that are gonna be basically uninhabitable. Think of the South Atlantic anomaly area. So, you know, my, re my thinking has been revised several times. As I've shared with you guys before, as a kid, I had visions, and as I'm saying a kid, I think they started when I was about 12, um, and I've seen the Four Corners area in my visions, and I've seen myself very old, um, and in that area, well, very old when I was 12, I was viewing myself as being much older, kind of like I am now, maybe a little bit older. Um, but I had seen myself in that area and basically doing a garden with people and uh, in kind of a community setting. And I've had that vision come to me several times. So, and then I've also, while I was working with people in a deep kind of trance state, I have actually had a vision that I take to be possibly ancestors on my father's side and they were five Native Americans and they were standing right in front of a map showing me the four corners and they were standing on the southern part of it. So they were in Arizona and New Mexico. So in my mind still, I, I am not sure which one I'm supposed to be in, whether it's Arizona or New Mexico. So I'm not sure. I'm still trying to gauge and looking for more direction. However, I've seen that. Then my left brain and traveling the world has led me to think, well, maybe I should do Costa Rica. And then I was kind of plan planning on Costa Rica, Panama, somewhere in the area. And then even Peru popped up because I did have a couple of dreams about Peru. Um, but looking at what's going on with the Ring of Fire, and looking at what's going on with everything happening. You remember we were talking about those cracks developing in Peru and actually knowing that probably the country that's going to get most decimated, or I should say the continent that's gonna get most decimated by the earthquakes will be South America um, because of what's going on there. And you know that kind of ruled that out for me and got me thinking back up about this area again um, and I'm open for guidance from, you know, above, and that's what I'm really looking for. So we're looking at a future map of the United States, and this is really kind of a composite map, and there are many of them out there in, by different sources, and they all kind of show about the same thing, little variations, but about the same thing. So this one obviously the dates are way off and like we have said before a lot of people throw the baby out with the bathwater, saying well this was all supposed to happen 10 15 20 years ago and it hasn't happened well it's starting to happen now and so we need to pay attention we need to realize that just because the timelines are off doesn't mean that the actual things that are going to happen are going to be totally different because the visions that these seers have had and we're talking edgar casey gordon michael scallion you know, we're talking the Navy map, which was done by a lot of remote viewers, and it's a composite map of sources that they believed, as well as many, many, many others. And you guys, too, I have gotten so many messages, and there's so much you guys have been sharing with me. And you know what? We all see pretty much the exact same stuff. We don't see things that are in direct opposition to each other. So 
like the U.S. Navy map. Again, the agreement points are if you live in California and if you live very close to the coast in Washington and Oregon, you should think about possibly moving. And I know it's easier said than done. I understand that, my friends. I really do. I understand that. And like I shared with you before, I love Florida. I want to stay here till you know one day before I have to leave because I love the beach. I love the sunshine. I love the Gulf of Mexico. It's my top choice. If I'm living in the United States, I want to be in Florida. Um, I do feel the magic out in New Mexico, and I fell in love with Santa Fe right away. So I did. I do feel like that's an area that I I do I am drawn to, and I do like. But I will always take the beach over the mountains. I'm just a beach over mountains type of person. But yet, you know, this feels like it truly is coming. So it's something to prepare for and keep in mind. And so, again, places like that you're going to want to really consider, you know, perhaps leaving like Louisiana, you know how it how it's been hit with the hurricanes all along the coast here at the coast in, in the Gulf area. All these people have seen the Atlantic seaboard basically inundated, the Gulf all submerged, and many sources have said, as Edgar Casey had said, that the Gulf of Mexico is going to merge with the Great Lakes. So right down the Mississippi River, where we've had all those strange fluctuations in uh, rivers, just, you know, the river going low in certain areas, and all these coastal anomalies going on in many different places really but if you're alongside the mississippi you want to think about you know getting yourself a little bit farther away so most of them show the lower areas of texas being in trouble if you're inland in texas you should be better off if you're in new mexico it appears to be very safe um, the only thing to consider is if you're up in the very high mountains, it's going to be very, very cold with the grand solar minimum and with us really descending into a complete ice age. Um, the other variable we have as well is how are the poles going to shift when they do? Now, there's a lot of people that say magnetic pole shift isn't going to change the physical poles, so it's not like we're going to turn on our side. And then there's people that believe otherwise, like Velikovsky and Hapgood and even Einstein himself that believed in crustal displacement. And when we look back, there's plenty of evidence that there have been crustal displacement events. How else would you explain, you know, these woolly mammoths with food still in their bellies completely undigested and flash frozen? You know, I mean, think about it. There are legends, too, from all over the world of these type of events where the winds are very high, the sun is standing still, or all of a sudden it's moving in the, a different direction. I think there's good evidence that, you know, crustal displacement theory is real. And there's many of you out there that, that well, I wouldn't say many. I, th I think of the subscribers and the people that are leaving messages probably only 10% really don't don't believe in crustal displacement. Most of you out there seem to believe in it as well. Um, so that is the other variable because if it does change and things shift, whether it's 20 degrees, 45 degrees, 90 degrees, who knows, you know, then you might find yourself living in Texas but being in the North Pole. So it's another thing where you're going to have to use your intuition combined with everything you're learning on the internet and from all these scientific sources to make your best guess. And I think when it comes down to it, for me, I will listen to the dreams I had going back the farthest. Um, as I've said, even though I will be so reluctant to leave the area that I am in. So I will wait until I feel like I'm being pushed to move out and that now is the time. But it doesn't keep me from making my plans now and searching for land in the area that I want to be. And then, yes, um, of course, there's all about building and getting the right type of property. And we've talked in the past about, you know, what 
do you do? Many of you out there are thinking just like I am and simply are you either have an RV or you're going to buy an RV and then you're going to look for the land and then you're just simply going to build something on that land when you find that you're in the right spot. And many of us are heading to the same areas. And interestingly enough, most of the people I've talked to, they're heading to either the Four Corners area or they're heading to the Appalachian Mountains. One of those two areas, and both those areas are supposed to be safe zones. Now, the Appalachian Mountains, um, you know, you're going to have really good soil there. Um, and you're going to have rainfall and seasons, and it's beautiful, and it's lush. Um, you know, it's gorgeous. It's a, it's a great area. There's more challenges, I think, out west, especially if you are an East Coast person like myself, and you don't know too much about living in the desert. So a lot to learn, and that is something that we need to start learning now, for sure. So this is a uh, site, Arizona Off Grid. And it's just, you'll find there's a lot of them out there because there's a ton of people thinking the same thing. So many people are doing the exact same thing. And, and my friends in Arizona are saying to me, oh my God, do you know how many people are out there prepping for the pole shift? And I was like, okay, so I'm not the only lunatic here, right? And that, you know, laughing. And they're like, no, no, no. I mean, there are tons of people in Arizona and in New Mexico and in other areas as well that are doing just this. They're getting ready for the grid to, to fall because it feels inevitable. And it will fall. I don't think there's any doubts that the grid's going to go down. Look at the magnetosphere declining. It's coming. It's, it's definitely something that's coming. So think about how you're going to have your own power and make do. You know, I've been watching so many videos of people that are building homes in different ways and some are choosing to go completely off grid and kind of stay off grid. They're, you know, making it so they don't really, they're in a location for one where it's livable um, all year round, relatively comfortably. And they're making properties that they could be without any source of power and be fine. Ingenuity. You know, um, we humans do have an innate sense of ingenuity and we will adapt and we will survive. So think about where you want to make your property that you're going to go ahead and use for your bug out place. Um, 10 prefab shipping container homes from $24,000. This is getting to be bigger and bigger. The whole tiny home movement. Um, it's, it's amazing. And some of the tiny homes are just freaking gorgeous. I mean, they're just beautiful. And this is part of, I feel, the transition to the new type of earth that we are going to see. You know, where the days of two people living in a 6,000 square foot mansion are kind of gone because we're going to gravitate away from that. That's kind of, it's kind of an ego-centered thing, you know, that we think that we need 6,000 square feet, 10,000 square feet, or that it's a status thing. It just shows how much we are worth. Uh, we're, we're changing. Many of our consciousnesses are changing, and we're reevaluating what truly is important in life and really what we need and we want. So shipping container homes are an interesting idea, um, and many people are, are opting for that. This is best places to live, or the best place to live off-grid in the USA, and it doesn't really give you a definitive answer because really everybody's best place is possibly different. Even regarding the earth changes that are coming, you know, there are going to be a lot of, still cho a lot of choices. And, you know, I have had messages from some of you in, say, like Oklahoma and Kansas and, you know, Iowa and Nebraska, you know, saying, do we have to go? You know, and that's an individual choice. You know, search, search your soul, search your higher self, ask your God, look for guidance and, and really look for that feeling of that warmth in your heart center where you know something is right 
merge that with the left brains analyzing all the facts and the data and see where is the best spot for you. Perhaps it's staying still. So, I mean, a lot of these places should be relatively safe. Of course, it's going to you know depend on a lot of different factors and we can't say for sure. So when we look at the ice, ice sheets and how they came down, keep that in mind because we are heading into something more severe than just a mini ice age. And again, there are different factors involved. Like you have to take climate into consideration. The climate that we have now as well as the climate that's going to come. And this article mentions citydata.com, which I have used multiple times for I have lived in, I think, seven different states in the last 10 years. And uh, I've used city data to get an idea about, you know, different places, you know, what's the climate like, what are the people like, um, you know, where's the safe areas, where's the places to avoid, all sorts of things, you know, and then even just like, hey, where's the best Indian restaurant to go to or the best Thai place? Because I love, I love food. Um, things like that, you know, so citydata.com and then Sperling's Best Places. Great, great resources. City Data has a forum on it. You could just put questions out and people will answer them. So if you say stuff like, you know, you're moving to Arizona, you look for the Arizona forum and just, you know, tell people what you want to do. And you're going to find a ton of like-minded people on there that will tell you what they did, you know, problems they ran into, et cetera, et cetera. And Sperling's best places, you could actually compare two possibilities. So say you're torn between uh, Sedona, Arizona and Santa Fe, New Mexico. You could put them right up and you could see all the differences, the difference in climate, the difference in crime, uh, the altitude, the healthiness of the air, the, the same thing with the water, all these different things you could compare. And, you know, it might make your decision a little bit better. Think about water. That's another important factor. You need renewable, dependable, clean water in order to survive, period, especially in the desert areas. And that's one of the things that is a big deterrent for going to the Four Corners. Desert land is cheap, and it's cheap for a reason, you know, because you got to find out. Also, you have to test. If you're going out to Arizona and New Mexico, test to make sure everything's good because they've done a lot of nuclear testing, things along those lines. Um, out there so you want to have all the tests done that you need to make sure that the area is safe see um, what the factors are as far as water are you going to have a water source are you going to be able to dig a well what are you going to do you know and go from there you need to know about the laws because that's one of the things for instance here in Florida um, <clears throat> the laws are much tougher and stricter and, and in some cases you can't build the type of home you want to build so find a, find out all about the building codes. You gotta you know have that covered as you make your decision. Think about taxes. Obviously, some places taxes are killer, and other places dirt cheap. I moved from Connecticut and was paying about six thousand dollars a year in taxes on a thousand square foot house to South Carolina, and uh, had a house that was double the size. And was paying about 680 bucks a year in taxes, you know, night and day. Zoning. So think about the zoning. Try to pick an agricultural property or, re or apply for rezoning or a variance in order to get your taxes lowered. So think about also the land price, how much you can afford, and think about timber and rock. You know, you're going to need building materials. So lots of things to think about when it comes to where is the best place for you to live? And this is really, I, I, I fell in love with these thanks to a very dear friend. How to build an earth bag dome home for 300 bucks. These things are so cool. But again, if you are in, you know, an area with, um, you know, highly developed residential area, you probably can't put an earth bag home in due to zoning. So it's something to look into. But, you know, out west, these things are great. And they are, you know, a dome shape is the strongest shape in nature. So very, very durable. And you, if you have the 
the ground around you to work with, you could make the walls super thick. So you could actually give yourself some protection from many different things that could possibly come along. So this is the construction that I'm going to look into for myself and have been doing research on, and this is where I am leaning. Uh, you then plaster them yourself and finish them off. So very, very super cool, I think. And if you could build down into the ground, that's going to cut your costs so much as far as heating and cooling and give you a very, very comfortable, sustainable year-round temperature. So really cool. And as it says here, they are incredibly simple to design and build. They can be adorned with a living roof or covered in mud or plaster. They're structurally sound and when complete can blend into the landscape, thereby minimizing the effects on the environment and also minimizing your visibility in some scenarios, which might be a good thing. They're inexpensive to build and might be an option for those folks to build on a limited budget. The Earthbag Dome structure below was built for a Mother Earth for Mother Earth News as an example of the construction technique back in 2009 for 300 bucks. Pretty amazing. Really very cool. So I would encourage you guys to look into that. Definitely. So as always, my friends, I thank you for joining me. Please thumbs up and help support the channel. As always, please leave your comments. Tell me what you guys are doing. Share with each other. I'm seeing great interaction between you guys, and I feel the Evolutionary Energy Arts family growing and sharing with each other and becoming an awesome resource for everyone that wants to come and join us in this endeavor, in this preparatory procedural thing we are doing, getting ready for all the big changes coming up, and we're not afraid. We are enjoying the ride. That's what it's all about. Enjoy the ride. No fear, my friends. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed, and definitely get the updates, and share with as many people as you can, because people that are aware and alert are not going to panic like most of the people that have no clue. So we got to wake people up as much as possible. As always, I thank you. Love and light to you guys. Take care, my friends.